We are back. A's baseball, past, present, future. I'm Ralph Tycho. The host is Patrick Tracy. How are you, sir? I'm quite well, Ralph. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's opening day week. And um, our A's, your A's, basically. I'm just... uh, just an old I'll guy. Share him, Ralph. Like, I'll share him. Lives, yard. lives within walking distance of the A's and promised the late Craig Pearson, who was the team doctor in spring training for them and a camp buddy of mine, a uh, summer camp buddy. Um, uh, he he uh, passed away and... Uh, I kind of look after them. He was a, an avid fan over the years uh, from when they were back in Philadelphia. That's how old we were. And um, so uh, there's a spot in my heart, except for the 73 season when they played my Mets and they um, they beat them in the World Series. It was the only World Series game I ever saw, the sixth game. Um and Jack Benny threw out the opening day pitch. Charlie <laughs> wow. Jack. Wow. Yeah. Was that the uh, Mike Andrews game or the one where they were going to boycott it? I, I think Mike that game? was a year earlier, but it – no, it might have been that, that same year. They played the Dodgers the year before. Um, it might have been that year, uh, but it certainly wasn't that game. It was the game that Seaver got beaten, and I knew as uh, momentum goes, they were not going to win the next day, the Mets. And um, I was fairly upset, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, <laughs> Can't say it any other way. Um, I can. This is uh, this is internet radio. Uh, it's no FCC uh, regulations. I won't take this moment to drop the f bomb. But uh, <laughs> but that's how you felt. Yeah, but that's how I felt, and I'm still thinking about it all these years later. Well, it was uh, it just wasn't pretty. It was, yeah. But I I love that Met team. They came back from so far, and they were playing a juggernaut of uh, terrific talent. Uh, um, over the, the three years that they won, actually it was five years in a row that they won division championships, um, it, it was um, – they were great. Uh, yeah, back at they're the, often referred to as the forgotten dynasty. Right, and uh, who who did you, I mean, you were just a kid, and I never asked you, you were from Fairfield, am I correct? correct? Yeah. yeah, near I Fairfield. I was on stationed farm. at Travis Air Force Base. Um, well, there you go, we were neighbors practically. Practically, and you probably <laughs> went to... Wonder World is that what they called it? That um, yeah, well, good knowledge on on North Texas Wonder World. Yes, that right. Better, good times. When good I, times. When I was I was stationed yeah. there for three years, and I okay. spent many many times driving around Fairfield. Oh, it's it's really. Uh, I'm sure by now it's grown up and it's become metropolitan. But by then we used to call it Mayberry because I was from back <laughs> east. <laughs> Yes, we called it other things, uh, square field, fair hole, fart field, flat field. Um, but, yeah, there was there was no there there, that's for sure. But Travis was there, the gateway to the Pacific. My mom actually was a school teacher at Travis Air Force Base. So she probably really? taught some of, your, some of your co-workers' kids. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely connected to, uh, to Travis there. So, yeah, and I grew wow. up in Northern California. I was nine, nine ten years old. When the A's got good, so just as I discovered baseball and tops baseball cards, uh, the swing and A's, and they were they were cool. They were had long hair and mustaches, and uh, that appealed to my uh, liberal leanings. Right, and right. became a rebellious side, side, if you will. Exactly, it was the seventies, so it was time to rebel, and uh, so right. and uh, so it, I, be- I think that mustache. 
thing came out of a bonding they had because of Andrews being suspended. Um, either that, yeah, a few guys grew mustaches, and then Finley went with it. He was a marketer, and he encouraged exactly. these guys. He gave them a couple of hundred bucks if they would grow mustaches. Exactly. And in those days, were, they were, yeah, they were going to have a mustache day uh, promotion. Right. And before, for the if you I forget what it was, but if you came to this game with and you had a mustache, you got half price or some discount. And he played the, exactly as you said, Ralphie. He paid the players a couple of hundred bucks to grow mustaches, and um, they, they Finley was so cheap that a couple hundred bucks meant a lot to these guys. So almost all of them did it. Well, you know, you bring back memories when they moved out here in 1968. I was stationed at Travis, and I just had a flash of reading a newspaper article about them that um, encouraged me to go down and see them, because uh, I'd been going to see the Giants at the stick, freezing my ass off, as, <laughs> as a matter of fact, as well. And uh, I got to see the A's in 68 when they moved out here. The catcher was a guy named Jim Pagliaroni who had a name that was fun for me to pronounce. <laughs> you know, speaking of baseball cards, uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it is that, the interesting names in baseball w- would attract a kid. And there, when I was a kid, there were a lot of nicknames, too. Uh, Schoolboy Row, uh, um, for one, um, comes to mind off a of baseball oh, card. Yeah. Um, sure, Dizzy Dean. I mean, that was the golden era of nicknames. My goodness, you know. Right. Uh, Whitey Lockman was the, the giant first baseman when I was a kid at the Polo Grounds, and Alvin Blackie Dark. They his nickname was Blackie. Um, and yes, yeah, so nicknames played a big part of it, and baseball cards certainly played a big right. part of it. I don't know. I how think I. You went went about collecting cards and uh, trading them with your friends. Uh, what was your experience like around baseball cards? Oh my gosh! I I think I paid your salary if if you were a top <laughs> staff uh, when I was yeah. collecting <laughs> because uh, my strategy was the uh, volume shotgun approach. Uh, I, I lived out in the country and there were no other kids my age within five miles so i i didn't have the opportunity to trade so it was very difficult to complete a set uh so i would go by i was working at the time on the farm and i get paid and i'd go into town once a week and i'd buy a case of tops cards at a time to get oh wow the few missing and then i'd have 36 pieces of gum that I didn't have to immediately chew, if you call it gum. Uh, I love it. But, uh, yeah, George Mitterwald, I spent probably, this is 1970s dollars, probably $100 on baseball cards trying to get George Mitterwald because that was the last, I think it was 770 cards or something like that in in a set for a year in a season back then. Anyway. Oh. Yes, George Mitterwald. I'll never forget him. Uh, let me tell you how I just you said George Mitterwald. In 1983, he was managing the Modesto A's. And I had, that was the first A's clubhouse I ever walked into. And sitting there was Marv Grissom, who was a New York giant when I was growing up, and he was working as a rover for the A's, roving pitching instructor. And in 83, I befriended him, and we, from that meeting, I I said, M- 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 Mr. Grissom, and uh, the manager, he, had a, he was the one that was going to introduce me to George Middlewald, and he did as the manager. And I called him Gus Grissom. I said, Gus, you're Gus Grissom. He goes, no, nah, Marv Grissom. I go, oh, my God, how did I forget that? You know, Gus Grissom was an astronaut and 
what have you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, George Middlewall was a, a catcher with the A's, and um, uh, he was – I don't think he was – he wasn't an A's player, if I'm not mistaken. He was a Minnesota – He was a twin most of his career. I, certainly yeah. when I was trying to get his baseball card, he was a twin. Right. Um, yeah, but, but I love the managing. baseball cards. I would I, – I would uh, – I wasn't smart enough to save them, right, and keep them all pristine. I put them rubber bands around uh, and touched them every day, you know. I would right. get – Get my Sporting News magazine back in the day. Came oh. every week, and on Thursdays I would, for me. It always came on <laughs> Thursdays for some reason. Nice, and I would go and arrange all the players, uh, pitchers by ERA and batters by batting average, their cards every week by team. Wow! So I had the team, and then I the, the ERAs. And, you know, for some guys who didn't have cards, I made my own. I made a Angel Manguel, who was a mediocre A's outfielder uh, for a couple right. of years. Um, Actually, he played in the field card. in those championship exactly. years. He, he was good pretty knowledge. decent. Yeah. yeah. He was supposed oh, to be for many, but he never um, came close. Yes. Yes. Boy, I'll, t- I'll tell you a Roberto Clemente story that um, I kind of skipped from time. For, um, Rick Peterson, former coach of the the A's, his dad was um, and the Mets. He um, his dad was a catcher, I think, if I'm not mistaken, with the Pirates, and befriended Clemente. And his dad, this was before Rick Peterson was born, and was going to go with he, with Clemente in 71, in January, I think it was 71. It might have been 73, but I think it was 71. He was going to go on that uh, miss, mission of mercy to... Um, Nicaragua, I think. Was it? Nicaragua, right? Uh, um, and um, Clemente said, "You know, you stay home with your family on this one. You see, you're a married guy. You stay home with your wife on this one." And he turned him that. You know, Clemente he said, "No, don't don't go." And we all know what happened. And that was before Rick Peterson was born and that um, conceived. And uh, Rick Peterson tells the story to um, uh, uh, one of the podcasters on my network, and I blank. Uh, I don't know if it was if it was Wayne or Ian um, about how that happened. And I, when I just cringe, I got it. Had to pass on that story. It was amazing, yeah. um, amazing. And he was a pretty. He was he was a pitching coach with the big three: um, Mulder and Zito and um, Tim Hudson, and Tim Hudson, who went on to Atlanta. That was a heartbreaking trade. As I skip around and we'll let we'll get <laughs> yeah, settled. Yeah, it was. It was. We the that was pretty lopsided. The age, uh, not just you know, got, see sometimes you you make trade you, you could say well things don't turn out you do it for the numbers and and this and that but what general managers don't realize is that a clubhouse is like uh, it's like an army unit these guys play together they they bond together and you make a trade, it goes more than just the numbers, what you get, good, bad, and indifference, indifferent, and what you give up. It's how a clubhouse can be, how a team spirit can die. And mm-hmm. if I remember, they were just going along great guns on one of their ups. You know, they go up and down, up and down, rebuild right. and trade off. And that one just didn't make sense from the, because he was the guy, you know, the bulldog. You, um, and 
you know, young pitchers coming up, they learn, they they mentor from guys like that, um, or guys like that mentor them, and um, it, it just screwed them up uh, for a couple of years after that. And um, yeah, you know, I can tell you're a uh, you're a believer in the team chemistry. Which uh, Billy B. I am. Says, uh, it has to go deeper than just <laughs> analytic, analytics and uh, and numbers, but it's a combination of things. And with that in mind, you indicated to me last week that you um, do have a, a general, if not a uh, a working knowledge about analytics, analytics and statistics and what have you. I want you to first tell me what your favorite new age statistic is. And when I say that, um, it's just beyond what you saw on the baseball court stats. <laughs> back in the day. Back in, <laughs> in the day. Um, right. We know we know. Um, so it's a twofold question. I want to know your favorite stat. And I want I want you to explain war to me in a way that a <laughs> oh, simpleton could uh, you could understand it. Yes. Well, uh, you know, that's 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 the uh, person explaining is a simpleton, so you don't have to worry about that. So my favorite stat, I guess, I have two for pitching. It's WHIP, uh, walks and hits uh, for innings pitched. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty good indicator of Absolutely. success, uh, much more than ERA, especially for relievers and just for starters for some degree. Um, and then war for offensive players, which is wins over replacement, which is a statistical analysis of the of the average uh, player at that position and how much better your statistics are uh, over the average. Or or yeah. below the average if if, if you're looking at uh, now that takes into the consideration right defensive statistics as well exactly yes that's the beauty of it um, is that it's uh, it's a holistic kind of 360 snapshot of of players I don't I can't imagine how they calculate it uh, uh, you know I'm sure it's pretty pretty complicated but I think when you right. look at you look at um, the war stats, and then you just eyeball who who the best players are. It usually matches up. Uh, you know, sometimes you look and you say, "Wow, that person won the batting crown," and you go, "Really? They're the best hitter in baseball, Daniel Murphy, or whoever, or home run crown, or whatever." But you look at war and you go, "Yeah, Mike Trout, he's the best." So um, right. those are uh, the, the, those are my uh, favorite stats, although, you know, I still well, a little let me bit give you my favorite, and I think yeah. um, it's o- OPS plus. Um, it's, uh, it's on-base percentage plus slugging percentage. I think that's what it yeah. is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is on-base, yep. on-base and percentage slug. plus slugging percentage. And you can uh, use that from a pitcher standpoint against as well. Right. Um, so, in other words, um, how badly do they hit you? And, um, you know, it's better than just batting average against you, which is about the only bat, uh, pitcher statistic that um, – isn't ERA, but WHIP is a great one. And I'll ask you this: Do you play rotisserie league? <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, because if I did, I would lose horribly because I would pick all A's players. Because I'm such a okay. diehard fan, I, w- I would never, I couldn't root for anybody other than the A's. So my entire roster would be A's. I would never pick Clayton Kershaw or Mike Trout. So. I would lose horrifically in fantasy rotisserie. So, okay, well, you play? Let, I hadn't played played for like 15 years in a row, 
never really won. Loved it. Started this network, started podcasting about five years ago, and didn't couldn't fit both in. Um, so I stopped doing it until this year. I drafted a team this year with Yahoo, and um, I'm playing it. Um, it. I have two A's. I have Cotton and uh, and Davis, the outfielder. So nice. Well, I feel, based uh, on, uh, based got, on the first week, Cotton got here very, very schlonged the other day, <laughs> as did three other pitchers. I don't have a good pitching staff. My my, my number one pitcher is David Price, and he's on the DL. Oh, likely likely to ruin my season by going um, having Tommy John, but make this still hope that um, he could rehab it and not have to. But I had Ian Kennedy get schlonged and um, <laughs> Quintana got schlonged. It was not for – and I, I have a hard time pronouncing names – I finally learned to pronounce Pineda's name, and then he got schlong, so I have to call him Pinata. <laughs> so, <laughs> he did get hit around like a Pinata. That's funny. four guys um, in one. Literally, Kennedy, Quintana, Cotton, and um, and um, Pineda, Pineda are all uh, all my pitchers, and they all got schlonged on that one day. So I'm going to rename the team the, the California Sea Otter right now and have been <laughs> for a long time. I'm just going to rename them base, Basement Bertha. <laughs> that's cause well, it's that's where early. they sit. Still early. Still early. You Pardon? can come back. Still early. Oh, You're absolutely. It's still early. I could come back, and I'm so likely to as well. Um, <laughs> you know, so, one of the things you, you, you mentioned earlier uh, – about Tim Hudson and, and uh, being a clubhouse leader and a mentor, uh, the bulldog. They, Sonny Gray, is often compared to Tim Hudson. They're both slight in stature um, and kind of have that bulldog mentality. And uh, I hope that Billy Bean learned his lesson by trading Tim Hudson away and, and keep Sonny Gray uh, as, right, as, as, which uh, we should call attention to that he has had some good um, pro- a good prognosis about what's going on, and he's starting to throw and he's extending it, and uh, he could be he, he could anchor a, a staff that shows you good things with Graveman, um, Graveman, yeah, Kendall Graveman, yeah. He, um, John Manaya. And I still Cotton Cotton has been so dominating at every level. Um if you look at his strikeouts to walks and everything, you don't give up on, on people after one game. I heard a lot of criticism about the um the Giants new relief pitcher. He got bombed in one game. It happened to be his first game. For, give it some time, <laughs> you, you know, the law of large numbers. Right, you right. hear these open it one way or the other, uh, the first week of the season, either you give up on them totally, or as you say, I can come back, and likely to over, over the course. Um, it still hurts, though, and I understand why managers go gray. That's uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, you know, fan is short for fanatic, so you cannot right. expect intellectual responses. Uh, you know, you get the emotional response, whether it's one bad outing from uh, Cotton or – although I don't know if you watched that game or not, but uh, his his line was pretty horrific. But they didn't hit the ball that hard. There were uh, a number of bleeders and doinks and dribblers and Texas leaguers – that uh, drove in the runs. It wasn't like he got hammered. Um, so uh, there's hope. There's hope for you. Absolutely. And there's hope for the A's, too. More hope than I thought. Who would you say is the closer? Is it Castilla? 
if you had a guess? Uh, I think it's going to be Madsen, uh, although Casilla got the save the first week. Um, uh, I think, you know, b- based on what uh, Melvin has said and what he's done in the first four games, it is going to be a fluid situation. Um, it's going to be matchups, uh, but um, – uh, I think in the, in the uh, you know in the long run, Matson's probably going to get more saves, but it could be because he do little and they have four closers on the staff, or four guys with closing experience. So um, I, I think you know the, the matchups are going to are going to uh, dictate the really. Yeah, the, like the Angels game where the Casilla got the save. The tough inning was the eighth inning. That's where it was Trout and Pujols, the middle of the order, and Madsen pitched that one. Um, you know, you Melvin know, is just the kind of guy who could turn this whole idea of having a set, this guy in the seventh, this guy in the eighth. Hey, there are times the closer should be in there in the sixth, because if he isn't, there'll be no eighth, ninth, and what have you. And... Um, the whole thing is is new to baseball comparatively, the whole closer thing, which brings to mind the Goose Gossage remarks about Rivera calling him a you know, one inning guy and this, that and the other thing. Well things were different in the Eckersley days or in the Raleigh Fingers days when you could count on a guy to come in and it took three innings to to get the close. They changed the rules very recently. So um, it would be nice to see something to see an innovative, innovative, innovative move made uh, by Melvin. Very bright guy from Cal. Um, caught the Giants in '87 when. Um, in the Krukow days with Jeff Leonard days when they won the division and lost um, the playoffs to St. Louis, if I remember. Right. Can't but, hold on uh, all those failed sliding catch. Yeah. Melvin, yeah. Yeah, he's won the Manager of the Year award in both leagues. So Melvin has. He's got a nice resume, and I think he's doing a great job with the – I think he's perfect, perfect guy for – to uh, – to get this team to the next level over the next couple of years. Um, once again, I sound like a uh, Pollyanna or whatever, but I think the A's are positioned to be um, okay this year, but uh, better next year and better the year after that. And I, there were many years where I couldn't say that, uh, but uh, I think that their their budget situation, their payroll, their farm oh, system. Oh, their probability now not even a, of getting a stadium would mean a lot <laughs> you know um absolutely yeah, yeah of, a new stadium if, if they know a stadium is coming these billionaire owners it's not a question of them be, not having the money to do it um if it if they could see a profitability down the line and once they get approval for a stadium, it increases the franchise value by uh, an awful lot. You're yeah, getting double outside double. investors. They, you have sure. a good role model the way the Giants did it across the bay. The, um, you have a city that's going to work with you now because all the other sports teams are, are gonzo, basically. Um, yeah. Uh, I look, I look to nice things in the future. Yeah, uh, you're so bright. We got to wear shades. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not that bright yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. Yeah. It's coming, Patrick. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, bat, uh, <laughs> things could happen, and always do. <laughs> what were the circumstances about Washington? He's back in Atlanta, again, off the subject. Uh, great so, we're still talking coach. age baseball. Yeah, you know, um, so some of this is fact and some of it is rumor uh, that okay. you hear. But um, 
he he took a lateral move, so it wasn't uh, because you know he felt. Does he, he live you know, close to? He li- exactly that that was the reason was uh, he's from Louisiana, and okay. uh, Atlanta was close. The A's actually when he got offered the Atlanta job offered him more money to stay. So it okay. was not – well, the A's should. always get blamed. The A's always get blamed for being on the cheap, but they weren't this time. They offered him more money to stay, um, and he chose to be closer to home. Now, that being said, the um, you know rumor is, to tie it back to what we were just talking about, is Melvin. Um, you know, he, he, he sees Melvin as uh, someone who's going to be there blocking his career path, if you will, right? So Melvin's not going anywhere. So maybe I go to Atlanta and, you know, maybe their manager isn't as entrenched, so I have a better shot of becoming the manager there. Rumor. Interesting. They give the manager job in Atlanta to Snitaker, who had been there for, like, in the organization. Did I hear, like, 50 years in in the organization or – um, a long time, a long time. A long Those time. career, yeah, decades. Minor, yeah, minor league guys. Nice to see, um, and, and it's been effective. Atlanta, since hiring him, has uh, done much better than um, before. Especially right, against right, yeah, there's. So um, <laughs> you and your man. yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I guess it always has to come down to it. Once a loser, always a loser. Fritz Peterson <laughs> told me. Because <laughs> Fritz Peterson, I, I had him on, is an avid anti-med guy, but a great <laughs> guess. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. Wow, Fritz, the wife swapper. <laughs> yeah, that, among other things. He came out pretty well on that one. He's He and his wife... <laughs> Have been together like thirty years. New wife. That's have been together like thirty some odd years, or even more. So, um, yeah, he, he quite a character. And in a day when uh, you know um, multiple relationships and this, that, and the other thing were not commonplace as they are today. There was a they broke a lot of ground. Um, and Jim Bouton's book broke a lot of lot of ground. You were too young to remember most of those players in '69. And um, right, yeah, I was just you. right there. I mean, I I remember uh, Kekich and Fritz Peterson. I had their baseball cards, but later in their career, not not the Jim uh, Bouton year. Although I, I read that book later when I got older, but um, but no, that was a little before my time. Right. What was the first baseball book you ever read? Oh my goodness! You know, uh, so I'm I'm going to take it. This is literal. Um, it was a, a kid's book that I got when you you know paid you filled up the little form in class. Uh, Pete Gray, the one armed outfielder. Uh, right. <laughs> Right. In the third grade. He had one arm. He played in the war years. He um hit like two thirty eight or something like that. A very well a very well hated player by his fellow uh teammates and what have you. They thought it was kind of a uh, almost a dog and pony show. Right. But, Circus act uh, or whatever. Yeah, but it was an inspiration to all the kids in the class with just one arm. Right? Yeah. Um, what would you remember what your first, first sorry, baseball book not, was? Um, it was? To all the kids in the world. And then came a true inspiration, because he was good, was Jim Abbott. Um, yes. It's a no-hitter. That had a um, – we were adults by then, but um, it was still – um, hey, time's up against it, sir. Just want to mention one thing. The A's have a prospect named Chapman. Yep. Same name as Eric Chapman, who lived in apartment 201 in Jackson Heights on 30, um, 3223 91st Street. 
<laughs> so my we who I had that apartment also. Eric and his sister Madeline lived there years after I did. So whenever there's a Chapman um, coming up, you got to mention him. Um, he looks pretty good. He's out just for seasoning, and the, you talking about the A's in the future. That's a name we're going to be talking about on this yeah. show. Absolutely, for a long third time. baseman of the future. Yeah, we'll, absolutely. We'll, 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 we'll chat him up next time. Good. Hope you're enjoying this because I certainly am, Patrick. I love talking to you because you got passion. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Good stuff, right. Ralph. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, have fun, and uh, next week, same time, same bat station, or however it goes. If I had Al Blumpkin here, he'd tell me how that goes. <laughs> talk to you next week, All sir. Right. You back. And everybody out there, keep on keeping on. Adios.